Respectable, respectable Dr. Endang Sulistiawati, MPD, as the head of Department of Languages, Art and Culture Management, Vocational College, Universitas Gajah Mada, 
The Honorable Speaker, Dr. Megan Armand, as Associate Professor of Wageningen University. Honorable Speaker, Professor Dr. Marsonus SU, as Emeritus Professor of Universitas Gajah Mada. Honorable Moderator of today's webinar, Mr. Sarani Peter Pakan, MSc. Also, Honorable Participants and all invited guests. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Also, good afternoon for Dr. Armand, due to the time difference in Netherlands. My name is Nurani Rizki Pertiwi, a student from Associate Degree of Business Travel Tours, Universitas Gajah Mada, 2020. It is a very great opportunity for me to be the master ceremony in this afternoon on 3rd November, 2020, on our event called <laughs> International <laughs> Webinar, Health and Medical Tourism in Indonesia, Challenges and Possibilities. This event is held officially by the Department of Languages, Arts and Culture Management, Vocational College, Universitas Gajah Mada, and also sponsored by the 11th, this Natalis of Vocational College, Universitas Gajah Mada, 2020. Now, I will read the agenda for this webinar. First will be the opening from Master Ceremony and the first photo shoot session. Second agenda will be the opening speech from Dr. Endang Sulistiawati, or representative. And after that, we will go into the main agenda, the discussion session moderated by Mr. Pakan with our two speakers, Dr. Arman and Professor Marsono. And we will close this webinar with the last presentation so we can still seeing the beautiful faces of our participants. So I hope everyone will be staying until the end of this webinar. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, following the next agenda will be the opening speech from Dr. Endang Sulistiawati that will be delivered by Eritrina Putri Ekantari as representative. Ms. Eritrina, the time is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me first welcome and thank our speakers today. The first, Professor Marsono, Emeritus Professor from Universitas Gajah Mada. And the second is Dr. Megan Orman, Associate Professor from Wageningen, Wageningen University. Sorry for the mistake. Thank you for being here with us to share with us about health and medical tourism in Indonesia. As we all have learned, this global crisis due to COVID-19 has changed most of all aspects in our life and especially tourism. Due to the need to comply to health protocols, we must stay at home and are allowed to travel only when necessary. Tourism experienced a stiff decline during the past few months and only rising a bit recently. Many experts have been speaking about what we can or should do to adjust ourselves to this situation concerning tourism. Because people need to have leisure. We need picnic. Traveling is fun. While com combining health and travel may have been impossible at first, later we learn that it is something complementary and indeed they are two things that can go together. Today, Professor Marsono will explore about the traditional medicine in Bali and how it can potentially be the site of and, the, and to research about health tourism. And Dr. Megan Orman will talk about the experiences and perception of Indonesia medical travelers in Malaysia and to talk about the relation between medical tourism and public health reform. Dear webinar participants, colleagues, DBSMB lecturers, and this event committee, let's listen to the two honorable speakers about this issue. Thank you. Now we are going into the next agenda. We will like to do the first photo shoot session that will be led by the operator team. Thank you.
Okay, perhaps uh, we will do the photo shoot session uh, right after the speaker discussion. Now, um, let me introduce our moderator for today. His name is Mr. Sarani Peter Pakan, MSc, a lecturer at Tourism Study Program at Department of Languages, Arts, and Culture Management, Vocational College, Universitas Gajah Mada. Graduated from MSc program, Leisure, Tourism, and Environment at Wageningen University, the Netherlands. Research topic includes surf tourism, human environment relation in tourism context, packing travel, and recently also doing research on overcrowding issue in Yogyakarta, Indonesia. In recent years, he wrote some academic articles, including one about surf tourism in Mentaiwe Island for Journal of Tourism and Culture Change. Another for coming one, still about surf tourism, for tourism, culture, and communication. Before we welcome the moderator, I would like to remind all of the participants to write down any comments for the speaker or the question on the comment section, but in YouTube Live or the Zoom chat. Thank you. So without further ado, now please help me welcome the moderator, Mr. Sarani Pitarpakan, MSc. Okay. Thank you, T, for the opening one. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself once again. My name is Sarani Peter Pakan. I'm a lecturer in the Department of Language, Arts, and Culture Management in Vocational College, Universitas Gajah Mada. Uh, I'm very honored to moderate this session because uh, we will have here two distinguished speakers. First is Dr. Megan Ormond. Uh, she is actually my former lecturer in Wageningen University. And uh, we also have here Professor Marsono, the Emeritus Professor at the Universitas Gajah Mada. He's also an excellent scholar who have uh, various research and community development projects across Indonesia. And uh, before start, uh, I would like to remind uh, the speaker that uh, each of you will have 20 to 25 minutes maximum to present your, your talk. And please, uh, you know, not except, uh, how to say, please uh, stay in the 25 minutes uh, area. And uh, after that, after the second speaker, uh, we will have the question answer and discussion session. So we will start with Megan, Dr. Megan Ormond, and then we will uh, have Professor Marsono at this, as the second speaker. Before going to Megan's presentation, I will read uh, her profile a bit. She is, a, she is an associate professor at Cultural Geography Chair Group at Wageningen University and Research in the Netherlands. She held a PhD in Human Geography from the School of Geography and Ge Geosciences, uh, University of St. Andrews, Scotland, United Kingdom, and his uh, research and publications center around the topics of transnational, transnational health, healthcare, migrant heritage, and disability travel. And she also uh, published quite a lot of number with uh, quite a lot of number article about medical tourism. And uh, her research was mostly taken in Malaysia, but uh, there uh, she met a lot of Indonesian medical travelers going to Malaysia to take the the, the, med, the medical treatment. And uh, with that in mind, she also write, she also write I think, uh, four or five articles specifically about Indonesian medical travelers. So without further ado, I would like to let Megan to present this talk. Okay. Good afternoon to all of you in Indonesia. 
and I watch and I'll try to. broader wellness cluster that, as I mentioned before, comprises spa, complementary and alternative medicines, uh, adjustments to our diets, 
uh, prevention, wellness, what have you. Another key concept that I want to focus on with you before we get into things more thoroughly is this concept of motivation. Uh, oftentimes we think about uh, medical tourism and tourism uh, is, is oftentimes connected specifically when we're talking about medical tourism to the linkage between people pursuing medical care plus uh, a leisure tourism component. So, uh, so they're interested in maybe getting cosmetic surgery elsewhere, maybe uh, getting other kinds of treatment, maybe cancer treatments, and also getting a chance to spend some time on the beach, get a chance to enjoy the city. However, what we've come to recognize over the years is that this, uh, this actual notion of medical tourism uh, comprises only very, very few people. Most people, when they're traveling abroad uh, for healthcare or for medical care, are doing so specifically for medical treatment. Uh, and they, their bodies and their mental conditions are not such that they are open to engaging in leisure tourism activities. So what I'm focusing on and what is the, the key focus for, for, for most all of my research has been the concept of medical travel. So looking at people who are crossing borders specifically for medical treatment and not uh, for bringing in the tourism industry, for engaging in the tourism industry per se. Um, Medical travel also acknowledges that people are traveling, are, are, are needing to leave their countries because they're not able to access um, treatment and care within their own countries. So it's an acknowledgement of what we can also call medical migration or medical exile. So what it is that prompts people to leave in, because they can no longer or have not been able to access the care that they need in their home countries. Now, another key concept I'd like to identify for you is the concept of residence. Uh, we can talk about medical tourists and travelers as being the people who travel from one country to another with the principal intention being to receive medical treatment uh, there and then to return home. So the idea is to go abroad and then come back. By contrast, uh, there are of course many people uh, who, are, who are migrants or who are conventional tourists who fall ill while they're in uh, their country of settlement or the country that they're visiting without uh, the principal intention of, of, of getting medical treatment, right? And so um, these, these, this key concept of residence is an important one because a lot of countries throughout the world pride themselves in having many, many, many hundreds of thousands of so-called medical tourists when in fact um, half or more of the people who actually are receiving care within their countries, so-called medical tourists, are actually foreign patients, are actually people who are already living within those countries as migrants. And this is the case uh, that we'll see uh, with, with Malaysia later on as I talk about it. Okay, so why do people go abroad for medical treatment? They go abroad for a number of reasons. Um, one of the key reasons is that our health systems, especially in, um, in, in countries with limited, uh, uh, robust healthcare systems um, have difficulty managing the growing rate of aging within our countries. And so our bodies are getting older and our health systems are not necessarily well equipped to respond to our bodies getting older, to uh, us encountering more and more chronic illnesses, chronic diseases, uh, lifestyle illnesses, like cancers, diabetes, these kinds of things that our health systems have not really been super well equipped for. Our health systems oftentimes have been more equipped to deal with public health issues around contagious or infectious disease, and not so much dealing with lifestyle illnesses, which have a very specific, very heavy burden on healthcare systems. So as our populations get older, our health systems are struggling. And we know that uh, because what we see is that throughout, especially uh, the global north or uh, high income countries around the world, we see this demand for doctors and nurses and other kinds of clinical practitioners uh, to migrate from countries in the global south or lower income, middle income countries to higher income countries in order to meet the needs of a growing uh, elderly population, of a growing population that requires uh, support uh, for dealing with lifestyle illnesses. So we see this with the case of Indian doctors, for example, being poached from India and, and moving to the United States, to Canada, to different parts of Europe. 
We see this also with Filipina um, nurses and doctors who need to leave their country because they're not able to uh, work within their country uh, due to economic issues uh, and move elsewhere in order to meet and satisfy the needs of, uh, of, of other countries for healthcare needs. So we see, if you take a look here at the map, that the proportion of doctors and nurses throughout the world is highly bloated in certain parts of the world and uh, emaciated in others. Um, this is an important thing to pay attention to uh, because of course it calls attention to the fact that there are significant inequalities in terms of access to uh, doctors and nurses throughout the world. So what we see here as part of this kind of broader um, model with which I believe many of us are familiar, this model of um, uh, paying attention to the ways in which core uh, high income uh, countries, high income groups uh, uh, extract resources uh, and services uh, from uh, peripheral countries, from, from lower uh, middle income countries. And so what we see is this demand uh, for good quality healthcare around the world and people choosing to go to these places where they're not, because they're not able to access healthcare in, in, in the places in which they live. We see this, of course, uh, throughout many parts of the global south. So you have here an example in the cartoon of, uh, of, of Nigerians choosing to go to the United States in order to satisfy their dental needs and their basic medical needs. And yet, what's also fascinating here is that despite the inequalities with regard to um, the heavy concentration of, of medical resources and human resources in wealthy countries around the world like the United States, because the systems are inherently uh, very, very full of inequality, especially, for example, in the United States, as you can see here in this uh, poster from the movie Sicko by Michael Moore, uh, people, even if they have access, even if they in practice have, in, or in theory have access to some of the best medical care on the planet, they're not able to pay for it. And so what we see is that people may be traveling to wealthier countries for healthcare, as in the case of Nigeria, but we also see people leaving wealthy countries like the United States in order to receive healthcare in, in countries where they can access cheaper healthcare. So we see Americans, for example, going to Latin American countries, to the Caribbean, to India, uh, to Malaysia and other places around the world. So we see people moving around the world in order to access things they're not able to access in their home countries. And yet, and what's unfortunate is that most of the research that's been done on so-called medical tourism or medical travel has paid specific attention to what we call the spectacular uh, north-south flows of people crossing from wealthy countries into poorer countries in order to access healthcare. And yet the vast majority of people who are crossing borders in search of medical care are people who are crossing them between Global South countries. And they're doing so in order to address uh, a range of routine health needs. And I'll be talking about that further in a bit. What we see though, because of this emphasis on this extraordinary or spectacular movement from global north to global south for healthcare or for medical care, we see um, uh, a number of, of destinations emerging in order to respond to that. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But why is it that people actually go abroad for care? Well, they might go abroad because they want to address issues around uh, their, their beauty, their physical image, their physical appearance. Uh, they might go abroad in order to address um, uh, specific, very high-tech healthcare needs that they're now able to access in their home countries. Maybe exper experiential, uh, sorry, experimental uh, health treatments, medical treatments like stem cell therapies that are regulated in certain parts of the world and not regulated in others. They might travel abroad for uh, surrogacy, for commercial surrogacy, in order to access. Um, women's bodies in order for um, babies to be, to, to be able to be born for a couple. They might also travel abroad in order to access um, other people's uh, body parts 
So there's, a, of course, a, a very uh, significant trade around the world in, in organs like kidneys and other parts that are taken from people, most of the time poor people, and, in, and, and pl implanted into the bodies of wealthy people. This is a, an image of people from the Philippines who have uh, gone through kidney surgery to donate, well, to, to, to give a kidney to someone and be paid for it uh, in exchange. People also travel, of course, abroad to access um, uh, or, uh, orthopedic needs. So as, as I mentioned before, populations are getting older. So we see an increasingly uh, increasing demand for hip replacements, knee, knee replacements, uh, and things like that as our bodies age, and you're trying to access cheaper uh, medical care. People also go abroad in order to receive more accurate diagnoses, not pleased or not able to access um, good diagnostic um, procedures within their home countries. They might also do it in order to access certain kinds of technologies that are unavailable in their home countries or access them more uh, more uh, affordably. Or, and as we'll see with the case of Indonesia later on, people also travel abroad for medical care in order to access more reliable pharmaceuticals, more reliable medicines, uh, because the, their countries may not have the regulatory procedures necessary to ensure the quality of their medicines in their home countries. So this is just a summary of what are some of the pulls and pushes for why it is that people cross borders for medical treatment. Yeah, so we've looked at how, it's, how, how it can be very expensive in certain places and people can save a significant amount of money in other places if they, if they receive medical care abroad. We've also looked at access. Um, so maybe a lack of uh, or insufficient healthcare facilities or personnel, um, ethical and legal restrictions in one country that may not be uh, applicable in another, questions of quality around uh, e uh, inferior standards to what's on offer abroad or lower tech facilities and equipment compared to what's available elsewhere. Just a summary. Where do people go? So as I mentioned, there's this, been this extraordinary focus on movements from the global north to the global south. And as a result, we see a very interesting kind of medical geography emerge of destinations that are seeking to target these wealthy uh, global North uh, patients. And you can see that here on the screen. Some countries might be uh, obvious to you, uh, India, Singapore, South Africa, perhaps. Um, but I think it's a really interesting geography of, of places that are being uh, developed as destinations around the world, largely uh, for their cost effectiveness, but also due to different forms of regulation that they offer. These are just some of the, the, uh, the advertisements that you can see from different countries around the world that promote themselves as medical travel destinations. Here's Singapore, for some of you who might be familiar with it. Indon uh, sorry, Malaysia. So what you see ultimately is that countries start to compete with one another for access to medical, uh, sorry, for, um, for, for international patients, right? We get, uh, maybe you, you guys are already familiar with this, this notion that the, Malaysia says that it has the best of everything. Singapore promotes itself as having the best doctors, et cetera. And yet this is problematic, this notion that indeed people from the global north are moving to the global south for medical care. This is again, a very small uh, percentage of people who are doing so. And yet, uh, what we see is, again, not only countries and governments promoting themselves as medical travel destinations, but of course, hospitals promoting themselves as such as well. And so there, there's this massive kind of development uh, throughout the world of hospitals that are seeking to cater to the needs of wealthy clients, wealthy, wealthy patients. And you can see here on the screen, uh, this is a, 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 a cartoon about a Thai hospital that caters to wealthy patients, wealthy white patients, wealthy Global North patients, while local patients are being told to go to the public hospital far away. So we see this um, aggravation, this increase of distinctions between, um, between wealthy and, 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 and poorer patients leading to two-tier care wherever people are. So let's go to Indonesia for these last few minutes I've got for the talk. 
In the case of Indonesia, uh, we can think about medical, international medical travel as by and large functioning as a coping strategy. And this is something I think many, uh, many of us, many of you uh, who are part of the group today may be able to, 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 to realize, to see maybe in your own families, um, people who have chosen to go to nearby countries in order to access healthcare that's not available to them uh, in, in, within Indonesia. And you can see here uh, a, a recognition by doctors, by associations of doctors over time that um, the Indonesian uh, health system is, has, has largely been unable to fully respond to the needs of Indonesians, uh, especially with the growth of lifestyle illnesses. Um, and with regard to the growth of, of, of an aging population and an, an increasingly middle class population. And so that, that increasingly middle, middle class population is the one that's able to, to go abroad. And what do we see that people are looking for? Uh, well, what we see largely, and this is based off of the research that I've done over several years, looking at Indonesians going to, Indo going to Malaysia and Singapore for healthcare. So people are largely looking for basic care, right? And they're crossing borders frequently, not just once a year, perhaps, but maybe several times a year in order to find uh, appropriate doctors for their medical needs, find specialists that are able to respond uh, and, and treat their conditions. Doctors who are um, more patient-centered, who, who don't just tout their medical expertise, but are really properly interested in how patients themselves are experiencing their illnesses, and uh, the ways in which um, the patients themselves would like to receive care. They're also looking for more accurate diagnoses. This is oftentimes the case with regard to cancers, with regard to neurological issues, with regard to even basic things like tuberculosis. Oftentimes these things have been um, poorly diagnosed within Indonesia and people go abroad in order to seek more accurate diagnoses. As I mentioned before, people also go, go abroad, uh, leave Indonesia in order to access more so-called effective medication. Now, the extent to which the medication is more effective uh, from other countries may be questionable, although the uh, regulations within other countries are oftentimes stricter than those that can be found within Indonesia itself. But of course, we can't, also, we can't ignore the fact that people also do a little bit of jalan jalan. And, uh, and, and like, to, like to get not just medication and, and uh, take care of their bodies, but also do shopping while they're abroad. Who doesn't like shopping, right? So where are people going? What we think, what I find really interesting uh, here, and this is also something that might be uh, noticeable to you, is, um, is that uh, Indonesians are so important uh, for, um, for the medical, uh, for the medical tourism uh, destinations to which they go. Uh, this is very definitely the case uh, with Malaysia and Singapore, uh, where you can see, for you can see in a, a quote here on top, it's not an exaggeration to say that Penang hospitals are built by the Medanese. So we see that people um, coming from different parts of Indonesia are moving to other parts of Malaysia uh, and Singapore in order to access their care needs. I myself did research looking at Pontianak, people leaving from, uh, leaving from Pontiana and, and Singkawang in, in Kalimantan Barat to go to Kuching for uh, medical treatment. And what we see really interestingly uh, is that um, Indonesians comprise the vast majority of medical travelers, no matter where you go in Malaysia, uh, but they, they, comp they comprise an extraordinarily high amount of, of patients in the city of Penang or in the area of Penang in the northern part of Malaysia. Um, and so you can see here this quote again, if Indonesian patients stop coming to Penang, the amount of revenue loss is equivalent to the operating cost per year for two average size hospitals. So we see here that um, Indonesian's patients have been extraordinarily important for a long time for, um, for the Malaysian uh, medical industry and they will continue to be so. Um, and that has had very specific impacts on the development of uh, Malaysian uh, medical treatment and locals' access to healthcare. And I, I speak very specifically to the question of Penang here. I'm aware that I'm almost up with my, with my 25 minutes, so I don't wanna take too much longer here. But what I want to say, and that's important here, is that there are sometimes there's, there's a belief that Indonesians are, are taking over 
Penang, for example. However, what we've found in recent studies is that this is not the case at all, that uh, hospitals have, have, have developed over time to respond to Indonesian care needs. But what we do notice is that Indonesian, um, Indonesian patients are making use of, of, of course, private Malaysian healthcare, and they're doing so in such a way that um, locals may be competing for uh, private um, specialist care with Indonesian patients. And um, so that's something that we need to consider in the future in terms of how to deal with that policy wise. Um, but it's also something that we just need to acknowledge uh, in terms of uh, ways in which we need to further develop um, the Indonesian healthcare system. Uh, I won't go into the impact of COVID-19 because I believe that I'm over time, um, but I just wanna thank you all for the opportunity to present to you today. And I look forward to talking with you uh, as we have questions. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Megan, for your very interesting presentation. And I believe that we will have time to discuss more about the uh, impact of COVID-19 toward uh, to you know Indonesian medical travel in the discussion session later. So uh, we will have the second speaker here, Professor Marsono. So as you know, as you know, the, the pandemic, this COVID-19 pandemic uh, has uh, a severe impact on tourism industry, but also uh, it provides another opportunity in the health uh, industry, let's say. And in the case of Indonesia, we have a growing, uh, you know, attention on herbal medicine. And this is actually the topic that Professor Marsono will will tackle in this in in his talk. In, in his talk. So there is a slight change in the in his talk. So uh, I mentioned before that uh, he will talk about the Balinese medical uh, herbal medicine, but uh, he actually will focus on the uh, Japanese herbal medicine as a potential site of tourism uh, attraction or tourism uh, say, tourism industry. Let's say. Uh, before I let Professor Marcelo. Uh, give her his, his presentation. I will uh, repeat her his profile a bit. So he is an emeritus professor at Universitas Gajah Mada. Uh, previously, he teach at Faculty of Cultural Sciences, but uh, now he moved uh, to Vocational College uh, at UGM. And his research and community development uh, activities center around the, the topics of destination development mostly on agro-tourism, agro village tourism, and religious tourism in Yogyakarta, Nusa Tenggara Barat, and uh, Jawa Tengah. He also once uh, did a community development project about Jamu Galeri in Indonesia. Jamu is a herbal medicine, in uh, Japanese herbal medicine. So he also did research in, in this uh, herbal tourism uh, topic. Currently, he is also the head of Indonesian Tourism Scholars Association in the Jakarta and Central Java region. So, without further ado, I would like to I would like to let Professor Marsono to give this presentation. Please, Prof. Good afternoon in Indonesia and good morning in Thailand. I will do presentation of what. Herbal medicine and herbal tourism in Indonesia, especially in Yogyakarta. History of Jamu in Indonesia, especially in Yogyakarta, was has been used in ancient time, especially by Japanese includes from three million until 1,000 years before Christ. The Japanese ancestors depended on nature at the time. In maintaining their health, they took advantage of natural elements. The natural elements derived from plant and animal. Those natural elements we use for herbal medicine and also Special objects be made to have good luck. Those are conducted by primitive predatory human beings. 
the audit document on maintaining health by printing the fund medicine is found in the relief of Borobudur Temple in Maglang, Central Java. It was built in the 8th century by Sir Jatinete Hot Mataram Kilton. After the Japanese learned to write on 9th century, it was documented not only cultural pattern, description, mythological, historical, moral philosophy, religion, law, custom, literature, art, economic, astronomy, technology, architecture, traditional food, but also traditional medicine, or in Japanese, or in Indonesian Jamu. Jamu in the 18th until 20th century literature. Classic manuscript of herbal medicine are classical Japanese manuscript which contain about the explanation of herbal medicine. Herbal medicine is not only to treat disease, but also to maintain health and wellness. Japanese classical manuscript of herbal medicine are usually given the title Serat Primbon, Primbon Jampi or Jampi. Its intensive file writing began, began in the 18th until 19th century. It also limited to manuscript or text copies a uh, publication of classical Japanese manuscripts for in the library of Yogyakarta, Surakarta, and Jakarta. Library in Yogyakarta are limited to those store in Sonobudoyo Museum Library, Pakualaman Library, Taman Sisomale Library, and Yogyakarta Village Yogyakarta Library. Libraries in Surakarta are limited to the store in Radio Pustoko Museum Library, Puro Mangku Negara and Rekshoto Soko Library, and Sono Pustoko Kraton di Jakarta Library. Libraries in Jakarta are limited to the store in the National Library. Among the masterpiece book and writing the Telenji Fulu of Animation, the following are mentioned. A. Jamu in classical manuscript at the Son of Victoria Museum Library. There are at least four classical manuscripts of particular ministry of particular medicine store at the Son of Victoria Museum Library in Jakarta. The text are this yeah, one manuscript number PTC or entitled Satibon. Manuscript number PTC for entitled Satin Bond contains predictive factors, type of diseases, and then many keys. Yeah. Uh, for example, the Corona Lu, Disney, Coromoto, So AS, Sakit Tangan, Eric, Lororotem, uh, and so on. And then number two, Manuskip number PPA certified serat ribuan warni-warni. Manuskip PPA certified titel serat ribuan warni-warni contain a wide variety of 10 to few diseases, prescription drug to keep well uh, and making correct and parm. And then number three, manuscript PP number A, 74, contain various of diseases, body, stomach, head, genital, drug, and method of its treatment. And number four, manuscript number SK, one for C B entitled to put in one jumpy jabi the manuscript number SK one hundred 
Forty Sleepy in the Eater to Two Freedom Chubby Chubby contain record of traditional medicine, medicine which are formulated from plant to treat various diseases as well as the use of raja for treatment. And number B, Jamu in Classical Manuscript in Paku Alaman Rai Bre. The manuscript of the medicine store in the Paku Alaman Rai Bre is number 2438 PP. 33 entitled Punika Kagungan Dalam Jampi Reken by Gusi Adipatianen. This manuscript contains various kind of traditional medical ingredients from the plant. And then, Jamu Classic Book at the Taman Sesual Library. Yeah. Some classic book of herbal medicine are also stored in Taman Sesual to Jakarta. One of them entitled Serat Pidon Jampi. Jampi. Yeah. It is said in the introduction to get the book content traditional Japanese literature with the similar inclusion and its benefit. It was copied Nascar Pidon for ancient time. This is Untaman Deswa and in manuscript. Uh, in the uh, classic monkey to Yogyakarta Pilis, there are at least two legacies of Jamu in Yogyakarta Pilis. There are catatan Jamu traditional one, yeah. this is Dayi uh, Kastung Koro, yeah. and Kitab Ribbon Ketal Jemur Adam Adam Makno, yeah. Kitab Timbon Betal Jemun Adama now has been reprinted in 5T7 since its first printing in 1969. It was said the Prakata forward section that this book in the tenet of Sultan Muhammad Kukwono uh, five, yeah. And Kapika Chakrana, Chakrana has collected the book, the title, Kitab Adhamakno, yeah. And the video of Budoyo Kraton of Jakarta Library, Kitab Adhamakno was not born. In the Kitab Adhamakno, and the Kitab Adhamakno, and Catatan Jamu Tradisional, yeah, it is said that at least 31 type of medical crack. Yeah, for example, uh, Jamu for women in pregnancy. Yeah, the, when a woman pregnant in addition, to her diet, it is not that the baby she carrying is healthy and need to eat. Need to eat, drink her time medicine according to the state of the pregnancy. Yeah, up the three month pregnancy, <coughs> yeah, the ingredients are trio uh, and so on, uh, and then this is three month pregnancy, this is seven month pregnancy, this is uh, seven to eight month pregnancy, and pitching nine month pregnancy. <coughs> and then Jamu to keep the protein. Yeah. In order to keep the protein and spirit to the, uh, focal, they are they can drink uh, Right, three cutting flour instead of tea. And then Jamu to have children. Uh, there are two, uh, there are two ingredients for her permission for those who want to have children. Tongle uh, and number B, chili and yang chai. Jamu for men. Uh, 
there are quite a lot of stamina drug comment medicine from uh, from various ingredient can be grouped into three groups yeah, in the form of drink food and putter yeah uh, the leaf of chocolate wall the leaf of soya puri sauce uh, lembuyang chili lembuyang chili turmeric potong leaf with uh, leaf tungtung dulu atas lewara temu samar silo ares banana everything morning with work with up to drink a glass to drink banyuan banyuan ta and then jamu kuyang yeah, and then jamu beras kentur put its medicine yeah, the painting the glove with minang and for top mark that are removed so that they can recover quickly are clean with one point petal leaf water and then number eight minimum is clean the nose that is bleeding with the back back block with a roll of petal leaf and then number nine medicine for for skin diseases paru kukit yeah and then medication for anemia we will eating refer of milk and number 11 medication for high blood pressure disease and number 12 room to to resist yeah by lactosan and number E, jamu in classical manuscript at Radio Pustoko Museum. Yeah. The classical manuscript at Radio Pustoko in Radio Pustoko Radio has at least one entitled Radio Don uh, by Atmo Supono. In this print bond contains various, various benefits of plant and animal element that can be used as medical head. And then number F, Jamu in classical monument from Sokolet Sopo Sopo, Idris Sopo Sopo, Mangku Negaran, there are many classical monument of tradition in Malaysia in Pura Mangku Negaran from Sopo Sopo. Even not this library, not only keep classical monument, but also continue to add and its collection by adding new published traditional medicine literature. Yeah, and then jamu in classic manuscript in Sono Pustoko. There are quite a lot of classical manuscript of traditional medicine store in the Sono Pustoko Library, Surakarta. Yeah. Uh, one of the most complete is entitled Karuh Bab Jampi Jampi Jari, yeah. manuscript number 500, 5T, yeah. R-A-S-M-P, yeah. 600, 17. Yeah. And Jamu in classical manuscript in the National Rapture. Manuscript of traditional Malay, Malinese, and Chifunese and Palmenicin are also stored in Jakarta National Rapture. At least those bits have been Latin, Latinized and translated into Indonesian a Malay manuscript entitled Kitab Tip. Yeah. Besar itu bukan set, cafunis manusia itu satu, tetapi and balines itu satu, and then yang number three jamu in twenty one century literature, traditional medicine, herbal medicine in the twenty In the 21th century literature, is contained in two forms, their book and website. 
the book and website that contain traditional medicine, herbal medicine are quite a lot because of the variety. and one website the description the description is as follow yeah a jamu herbal nusantara one dozen one ramuan tradisional asli indonesia by suparni and ari wulandari published two dozen In the book entitled Herbal Nusantara 1001 Ramuan Tradisional Asli which gets 308 pages, Suparni and Ari Wulandari describe that there are 347 medical plan or traditional Indonesian cap. The classification of medical flora and fauna are divided into three based on A, medicinal plant. Yeah, in this 128 pieces. B, cap and species, 195 pieces. Three are the natural ingredient from flora and fauna element, 24 pieces. And the medical help, spices, and as well as from other natural ingredient are identified as Indonesia, Latin, yeah. uh, photo, lot of variant content, various composition of number of traditional ingredients and various beneficial properties. And this is uh, content of herbal nusantara asli satu ramuan rasional. And number B, jamu usaka penjaga kesehatan bahasa asli Indonesia by Murtiati Oh, yeah, yeah. I would just yeah, uh, and then because the time only five minutes, I am. Continue to jamu in website jamu kudokas Yogyakarta. Ya, in website jamu kudokas Yogyakarta, ya, in merapi farmahibla divided into seven part. Ya, home, redak, outlet, travel, food stall, aquaponic, and contact. Uh, home like its subtitle name contain an introduction to all and rest of the section. Uh, product contain offered by Merapi Herbal including Jamu Bodok. Yeah, 19 type, special blend hub, health drink, uh, 9 type, herbal kedudung, 62 type, medic, medicinal plant, to 168 type and vegetable salad and its benefit and hand sanitation. Uh, not all not all of them will be discussed here. What will discuss it are only the Jamu Kodok, yeah, about the drug, and drink, plan, and practice of herbal medicine making process as the tourist attraction. Uh, this is Jambu Kodok. Uh, so, uh, this is the photo, photo material composition, uh, Jambu for edges and good point job. Uh, this is benefit and how to use. Yeah, one, 
Chakalinu, yeah, and then Chakamak for maintaining stomach health, and Chakaku uh, for increasing strength and health, and Chakalanset for increasing fit and fit. And Chakaswal, a reduced blood fat, and Chakamis, a heart set stone and the kidneys, and Chakatu, a malurukan fatu to kijal, heart set stone in the kidneys, Chakatal, a reduced itching on the skin. Yeah, and Chaka Srat, uh, relief itching and pain in the joint, and health drink medical medicine yeah. uh, The nine type of health health drink are as below. Yeah. Health drink, yeah, temulawa, yeah. Uh, Temulawa, Sirifangi, for strength to peace, yeah. healthy drink, uh, Kumirasan, for health smooth menstruation, and Jai Wangi, uh, health overcome cold and great to lens. And brass control, yeah. Uh, health deal with no say coach and flat lens and chai special, yeah. Health overcome cold and play to lens chai mirah, yeah. Health cope with migraine, stiff and sore and reduced. Uric acid level and kunir putih, yeah, head overcome kanker, uh, bronchitis, and uh, this is new, yeah, with gang corona. Uh, herbal plant and the practice of making herbal as a tourist attraction. Jamu Godok Khas Yogyakarta was open. One Based on the data in the booking list visitor, which just fell in from January 2019 until January 2020, it seemed that the potential new tourist attraction opened the LA uh, 2009. Uh, until early 2020. Yeah. In one year, January to December 2019, there were 72 visits with 3,833 visitors. Thus, the average visit per month in here, yeah, uh, six, yeah, six times. Then each visit consisting uh, 81 people. Gross income in one year, yeah, this is uh, three four nine million <coughs> nine at zero 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 zero. Average gross income in one month, yeah, itu Twenty nine million one 
165,000. And then uh, the following picture show herbal plan and the practice of making herbal medicine and storage attraction. Uh, like this, yeah. This is uh, herb of herb in pot. And then visitors are observing and listening to the herbal planting process from the guide. Yeah. And then visitors are listening to the benefit of one of the herbal plant from the guide. Yeah. And this is guide uh, from Rapi Herbal, and this is visitor. <coughs> Visitor are listening to the benefit of one to the other herbal plant from the guide. Yeah. This is guide and this is visitor. Uh, to guide this and this. Yeah. Visitor are listening and observing and observing the maintenance of herbal plant from the two guide. Yeah. This is visitor. This is uh, to guide. Visitor are practicing packing jamu, mess and ingredient. Yeah. Uh, this is asma in Cisni Sindu. Kita tebuk dulu lagi di macam. Visitor are practicing making jamu, squeezing ingredient. Jadi uh, memeras, mencampur, membuat sebuah membuat sendiri. And then visitor are practicing making herbal medicine, boiling the ingredient in the stainless steel pot. And then visitor are observing how to make herbal ingredient. This, yeah. Visitor are observing how to make herbal ingredient. Visitor are observing how to make other herbal ingredient and listening to explanation from the guide. This is uh, the guide, and there are uh, visitor. Visitors are observing the final concoction of herbal medicine that are ready to sell. Uh, this is the uh, finished effect. And visitors are uh, able Conclusion. In order to, meet, to maintain the health of Indonesian, especially the Japanese, it is needed to take advantage to the plant and animal around. The use of herbal plant has been conducted since prehistory time. The oldest document of the use of herbal plant is found in the relief of Borobudur Temple, 8th century. In accordance with time, the recording of herbal medicine change according to the progress of the era. After 9th century, Japanese ethnicity recognized the letter Sundan Herbal Medicine was recorded in the manuscript. After getting to know printing publicity, as well as Herbal Medicine were published in the printing form. The publication of traditional medicine became intensified in the 8th until 20th century. In the digital age, the digital publication of traditional medicine also changes yeah, 21 century. The new concoctions, concoction were created for the creativity of community to answer to challenges of the emergencies of new diseases. One of the new Concoction is string with Corona. 
It was created by Merapi Herbal to maintain the body immunity from COVID-19 attack. Likewise, the potential for herbal medicine as storage attraction since the beginning of to oh, nineteen has been introduced by Merapi Pharmaca. The public response was overwhelming. Uh, you, I think it's not about, uh, about herbal medicine as well as and herbal tourism in Indonesia, especially in Yogyakarta. Thank you, Prof. Marsono for the presentations. The latest one actually is very interesting, Wedang Corona. It literally means Corona drink in the Japanese language. So as I said before, uh, during the this pandemic, there is growing tension and uh, demand for the herbal drink, herbal medicine, and anything herbal. And uh, I think actually the pandemic can give us uh, quite opportunity in this, in this uh, field especially. So uh, now we will uh, move to the question and answer and discussion session. And actually in the chat box, we have we already have some questions. And I, I will uh, let others that uh, we, that want to ask the question to put their questions uh, in the box or uh, if you know, you can ask your question directly through, you know, through the, the window. And, uh, but I will use first my authority here as a moderator to ask a question to Megan. Uh, and actually, this is my personal uh, curiosity. Sorry for the big rain here in Jogja. So uh, I would, I really wonder about uh, the pandemic situations and uh, how the Indonesian medical travels are affected by this. And for example, in the case of Penang, what is actually happening in Penang now since there is no, you know, incoming Indonesian medical traveler there, uh, and you know the general. Uh, medical travel situation uh, among Indonesians. Yeah, thank you very much for the question, Peter. Um, <clears throat> what, what we see happening, of course, is uh, we've had, we've experienced an, an unprecedented um, situation with the pandemic, uh, in that more national borders closed as a result of this pandemic than ever in the history of of of, uh, of, of national borders. Um, and what that has meant, of course, has been that. People haven't been able to leave their countries uh, in order to pursue medical treatment, or if they have been able to do so, it's been under very, very limited uh, or very, very specific restrictions. Um, and so what we see is, of course, that people's medical needs, uh, besides those connected to COVID-19, continue, of course, right? People continue to have diabetes, people continue to have tuberculosis, people continue to have cancer. So this, this situation has meant that people have not been able to access treatment and pharmaceuticals uh, that, that are necessary uh, for their own individual uh, well-being and for their, for their health. Uh, that's had dramatic impacts also, of course, in terms of people who are, who are in need of surgeries, uh, operations. And, and what we know uh, in, in terms of the work that I've done on Indonesians traveling abroad for medical care is that most of the time when people are traveling abroad um, either they're doing it for routine medical needs, you know, in order to access uh, specialists, what have you, or they are, um, they're really in acute need. So the, their, their conditions are already very severe because they haven't been able to treat them back at home in the way they would like. And so what's happening is that people who with already severe or acute conditions are not able to access the care that they need. So this is, this is a really a, a problematic situation, not only of course for Indonesians, uh, but also people from other global South countries who are not able to, um, who don't have the, the, the medical uh, conditions, medical services that they need in order to support their healthcare uh, issues. What we see in terms of response is, um, at least in the case of Malaysia, Singapore, we see a growth of the use of telemedicine, such that Indonesian patients, for example, are able to uh, make telephone calls or Skype or Zoom calls with doctors, with clinicians in order to um, have consultations uh, through the internet. 
We also see the rise of pharmaceuticals being sent from, for example, Malaysia to Indonesia. So uh, through these teleconsultations, people are getting their medications prescribed, and then that allows them then to legally have their medications be sent across borders. Um, this, is, uh, this, is, this is really, of course, very urgent in the case of people who aren't able to go to uh, Malaysia to get their prescriptions refilled. Uh, although we do know that people oftentimes will get their prescriptions uh, in bulk when they travel abroad, and in order to be able to bring it back for a very long period back home in Indonesia. Um, so, so those are two things. So teleconsultations, medication, but we also see, and I think this is what's really interesting to me, uh, is that governments around the world that are promoting themselves as medical travel uh, destinations are doing so, um, are, are really of course aware of the, the potential disaster for their medical tourism destinations for uh, them e e economically. Uh, and so what they've done is very, very quickly after the peak of the pandemic, uh, so uh, let's say by May, June, uh, we already started to see in medical tourism countries, medical destinations, uh, the opening up for patients with specific medical needs from other countries. So Indonesians now with a very acute medical conditions, with very severe medical conditions can now travel to Malaysia for healthcare. This is also the case uh, in, in, in Thailand and other countries. So they've opened up this kind of uh, very interesting um, exception uh, to patients in need. But uh, that's meant that people in these destination countries have also started to critique, to be very uh, upset in certain moments about um, this exception. So letting sick people into, uh, into the country when already uh, people are concerned with health issues and overburdening the medical system. Okay, that's very interesting, actually. And I was wondering why not the government built their, you know, our own health reform uh, back home. And I think it's also another interesting point. But now I also would like to move to uh, Professor Marsono. Uh, I would like to ask you, Prof, uh, what is uh, actually the concrete ways to, uh, how to say, to make jamu, the herbal medicine or herbal drink, uh, into, uh, you know, uh, very strong tourism marketing or tourism promotion strategy? Because actually in Yogyakarta, for example, we already uh, know a lot about Wedang, uh, you know, there are various wedang in Yogyakarta and actually tourists are consume it as well since a uh, long time ago. But how to make this jamu or this wedang is a really a strong point to, to, let's say, promote Yogyakarta tourism in this case. Which I ask in Indonesian, yeah. I answer in Indonesian. Yes, please, bro. I will try to summarize. Ini merapi farma herbal saja membuka itu sebagai daya tarik wisata baru tahun 2019 dan tanggapannya masyarakat seperti tadi luar biasa artinya potensi jamu herbal itu yang itu merupakan warisan dari nenek moyang yang sudah run temurun Sebenarnya sangat luar, sangat potensial untuk eh, apa di ya direvitalisasi lagi. Masalahnya adalah sekarang anak-anak muda cenderung cenderung inginnya eh, ya itu itu juga dipengaruhi oleh pendidikan yang 
dari sejak TK SD sampai perguruan tinggi seolah-olah warisan budaya nenek moyang ini tidak pernah disinggung tidak pernah di ya di nah gini juga dari wawancara saya dengan Merapi Herbal itu Merapi Herbal sejak Corona ini tidak pernah tutup dan pengunjungnya rata-rata walaupun lain-lainnya tutup pengunjungnya itu rata-rata saya tanya 50-an ada yang beli langsung di situ hanya yang memang pengunjung mau berwisata yang seperti tadi cukup potensial cukup banyak itu sampai sekarang belum ada yang membeli jasa itu jadi Bukti di lapangan juga itu persentase yang terserang COVID tingkat dunia itu kita relatif saya melihat perkembangan di koran dan di berita-berita media televisi kita relatif lebih sedikit daripada negara-negara yang super maju sekalipun. Nah, ini tampaknya karena minuman-minuman herbal itu. Nah, jadi kita wajib, saya betul-betul sangat menghargai sewaktu saya diminta membuat jamu tradisional kaitannya dengan wisata hampir-hampir saya tidak mau saya sanggupi saya hanya punya modal pernah presentasi jamu tradisional dalam naskah itu lalu saya coba-coba berkunjung ke Merapi Herbal saya cek seluruhnya waduh waduh luar biasa ini ini kreativitas ini Artinya apa? Kreativitas bagaimana? Itu berbagai jenis ya dunia flora dengan berbagai jenis tanamannya itu menjadi daya tarik sendiri. Lalu bagaimana memprosesnya menjadi daya tarik? Tidak hanya waktu mengamati tapi juga mereka praktek Lihat itu foto-foto tadi, semuanya senang, semuanya gembira. Nah, lalu e, meletuslah COVID-19. Nah, e, setelah COVID-19, ya sudah e, apa? E, sebenarnya memang perlu seluruhnya, seluruhnya kalau ingin ilmiah. Begitu jumlah yang menurut saya tidak terbatas jumlahnya itu, jenis-jenis jamu untuk menjaga kesehatan dan untuk pengobatan, memang begini juga. Kalau kita memakai jamu herbal yang tradisional, itu sembuhnya lama. Ukurannya harus kira-kira sampai tiga bulan. Tapi kita sangat kaya. Nah, Sangat kaya, tapi uji klinisnya hampir semuanya itu belum pernah dilakukan dan hanya turun temurun. Nah, sekarang kalau ada pertanyaan bagaimana eh, apa jamu untuk daya tarik wisata, ya sudah jelas itu eh, apa Januari tahun 2019. sampai Desember tahun 2019 luar biasa itu yang apa itu kreativitas merapi farma herbal nah, silakan ya bro sudah Kalau, dapat poin ya ya sudah bisa dipahami ya ya bro nah, ya <laughs> oke okay. so I, I will like to summarize a bit uh, what Prof Marsono talks about so You say that uh, there is a great in- initiative from Merapi Herbal, Merapi Herbal in Yogyakarta that creates jamu as a 
central tourist attractions since 2019, and it's actually uh, got an amazing response. And uh, he also said that Jamu Herbal or uh, Herbal Medicine, Herbal Drink has a lot of potentials to be promoted as a, one of the tourist attractions, not only in Jogja, but also maybe in other places like Bali, uh, other places. And he also mentioned that uh, actually Jamu is part of uh, our heritage. So it's it's really possible to build it under the heritage, uh, let's say, uh, heritage tourism, uh, you know, part of heritage tourism, because uh, the ecological knowledge uh, entails in Jammu is actually very rich, and uh, this is something that uh, we have to celebrate as Indonesian, uh, Japanese, Balinese, etc., etc. And uh, uh, but the, the pandemic has uh, not stopped, but has uh, impact this this uh, new niche quite a lot. Uh, but uh, he believes that in the future especially if you target the foreign market, the Jammu uh, uh, best tourism, let's say, can uh, excel in, 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 this, in, this, uh, in this country. So uh, now I will move to the chat box and uh, read some, some questions. First, we have a question here for, from uh, Nurani Rizki Tiwi. Uh, So she would like to ask uh, about this, yeah, the, the psychological, uh, how to say, the psychological share, the psychological, uh, it's like, uh, yeah, the psychological value of uh, medical tourism, especially among Indonesians, because uh, she noticed that uh, some people in Indonesia, after when abroad to have medical checkup, are bringing it to to the friends, family, etc. And this is actually a very interesting question. This may <laughs> no, it's 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 a really interesting point, Nurani. Is, is it Nurani or uh, Ritsky? Um, you can call me Piwi. Okay, Piwi. Okay, all right. Thank you for your question. I really appreciate it. Now, you're absolutely right. Um, if in many cases, of course, uh, traveling abroad is associated with status, right? Whether that be for uh, pure leisure tourism purposes or that be connected to 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 medical um, uh, satisfying our medical needs and concerns so there's no doubt there that uh, that people definitely make use of uh, medical travel medical tourism in order to uh, demonstrate their status within their societies back home uh, we see this especially uh, what's, what's very interesting is uh, so I, I mentioned before I've done work uh, in Kalimantan Barat with with people who are traveling to um, to Malaysia for healthcare to, to Kuching, which is the, the closest kind of Malaysian city where people can receive healthcare. And what I noticed is that, that um, you know, people people would oftentimes go to Malaysia to satisfy their 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 basic needs, their most urgent concerns. Um, but if they really wanted the top, top, top quality, they would go to Singapore or they would go to Australia even. Um, because so so we, we we can very definitely acknowledge that status plays a specific role. Uh, ideas of, of of hierarchy these are oftentimes connected to um, to economic uh, you know you know countries that are wealthier but also countries uh, you know with uh, you, know, the, you know with 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 white people uh, also being the ones who who, who are doctors. Um, so so it's a racialized issue. It's a socioeconomic a question of, of status very definitely. But at the same time, I think it's very important to acknowledge that the vast majority of people who are traveling for healthcare for medical purposes are doing so because they need it. Um, and and that one of the things that really uh, uh, ha hammered that home to me when I was doing my work uh, in, in, in Kuching and, uh, and in Kalimantan Barat was that um, in, in big cities like Pontianak, for example, there are very, very limited um, services for people with cancer, limited oncolo oncological treatment uh, possibilities. And so if you've got cancer, your options are to go to Jakarta for care or to go to Malaysia or to Singapore. And oftentimes it's cheaper uh, to go to Malaysia than it is to go to Jakarta. And I think that says something very specific about the nature of the Indonesian health system. Um, uh, and, and I think it's something that we, we really need to pay attention to because it's a, it's a direct reflection of the inadequacies of our own health systems. And I say that as a person who comes from the United States originally and who also saw my own family 
choose to go to other countries for medical purposes because they weren't able to, able to access what they needed. So there's something to also consider there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Uh, we also have here another questions from Regiana Amalia. Um, she says medical tourism has a good impact benefit for the patient and the distancing hospital in other country. But what if, for example, all Indonesians are going to Malaysia or Singapore or Thailand or et cetera, or another country? Uh, is there any impact that uh, that, yeah, that the, this 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 trend have uh, on Indonesia or on the country that uh, experienced this? And I will add maybe uh, in the context of health reform, how actually medical tourism health reform in Indonesia, how actually medical tourism can at the nuances uh, in our attempt to, to build or to design a good or solid uh, health reform. Yeah, th thank you so much for, for the question, Peter. Thank you, Regina, for your question as well. Um, how to begin? So because this, this is an extraordinarily complicated uh, issue. Um, I think what's important to first observe is that Indonesia is not alone uh, in, in acknowledging the fact that many of its people are choosing to go abroad for healthcare. I mentioned the Nigeria example earlier in my presentation. Uh, and in both cases, in both countries, what we see uh, also in, uh, in social media, in, in media coverage, is oftentimes a public shaming of people who choose to go abroad for their medical needs. Uh, we see this, especially when it comes to politicians who have chosen to leave their countries uh, and, and, and get medical uh, treatment abroad. Uh, but we see this also among people who are part of the middle class and upper middle class. And the idea is that, is that Indonesia, Nigeria, these countries are losing an extraordinary amount of money uh, that could be invested in the national health system in order to improve it. But because these services don't exist or don't exist uh, to the standard that people would like, they choose to go abroad. So they're investing their money elsewhere. So they're ultimately they're voting with their pocket, pocketbook, right? Uh, so, so I've been very interested in this question of, um, of thinking about um, the ways in which we consume, right? So political consumption ultimately becomes, becomes a very significant question. Where do we choose to put our money and why? And what does that say about the systems in which we participate and how we choose to participate in them? Uh, so that becomes a very interesting situation. So yes, it has extraordinary impacts on destinations. What I, what I argue and, and I have tried to show in, in different things I've written over time is that I think that medical travel, of course it can take money away from systems, but it can also teach systems very important lessons. Uh, so uh, Indonesians who are choosing to travel to Malaysia, to, to, to Singapore, to Australia, what have you, are learning about how doctors can interact with patients. They're learning about how to advocate for themselves and to identify the kinds of, of uh, medical services that are available to them uh, and the different kinds of pharmaceutical options, what have you. So they're able to bring that knowledge that they've acquired abroad back to Indonesia and to begin to demand it as well in their, in their local health systems. I did interviews with doctors uh, in Pontiana in hospitals and in private clinics. And they acknowledge that um, their patient, uh, attention to patients uh, is not as good as it could be. And this is part of a kind of broader tradition among doctors. And this is only really, uh, only recent generations also in other parts of the world. Uh, doctors uh, oftentimes are seen as, you know, very respected members of our society and they have extraordinary knowledge. However, uh, they oftentimes think that they're the best and that they know best. And so what we see is this movement towards patient-centeredness uh, throughout the world, where we start to pay attention to a dialogue between doctors' knowledges and patients' knowledges of their own bodies. And that's uh, what I think is very powerful. And we start to see awareness of that among doctors in Indonesia. So there's going to have to be a very important systemic change with regard to the structure of the health system, but there also has to be a soft change among about the ways in which doctors are trained and how they interact with their patients. Okay, thank you. It's very interesting. So, actually, travel can act as, uh, you know, self correction uh, mechanism. Mm -hmm. Maybe not only in medical travel, you know, because sometimes when we travel, we actually self correct ourselves, right? So, mm -hmm. medical travel is just one part of, of it. Is there any questions that? Uh, 
other participants would like to ask directly. I will let you to ask uh, yeah, directly if you have some questions to Dr. Margaret Almond and Professor Marsono. No. Okay, uh, maybe as a closing, I would like to ask both of you to, yeah, to deliver a, a like, take home message to, to all the participants here. And I will start with Megan. Oh, Peter, you put me on the spot. Hmm, uh, a good take home message. Hmm. My take home message, I think, would be um, we need to do more research from the perspective of people who are traveling abroad. And I would really love to see, you know, you all showed some interest. We have how many people? We have 94 people right now in this room. And you've all showed some interest in uh, health and medical tourism, medical travel. Uh, and I would just like to invite you and encourage you very, um, very strongly to think about how you might be able to uh, contribute to developing research on what it is that, that draws people uh, outside of their countries of residence for, for medical purposes and what are the effects of it. Um, and I'd love to, to keep in touch with people who, who, who would like to explore that further. But I think that this is a discussion that needs to happen um, in a lot of different places. You know, it's in, it's in the health sector, it's, in, it's, in, um, it's within our families. Uh, it's in within our communities and and the more we're able to talk about these things and explore them with facts uh the more useful uh it can be and the more change we can bring so thank you all very much thank you now i will let the professor marsona to deliver his take home message yes go, bro. yeah okay Dari pengalaman yang mungkin ya, sejak dunia ini adanya pandemi COVID-19 baru kali ini dan hampir-hampir sudah berjalan satu tahun. Kita menyaksikan bahwa macam tadi artinya jamu-jamu uh, obat tradisional ini sangat bermanfaat untuk menjaga imunitas dan pengobatan ya, khususnya itu apa semacam sejenis penyakit ya influenza covid dan lain sebagainya itu sehingga saya berpesan kepada semua peserta karena yang turun temurun sudah terbukti nah kalau ingin kajian ilmi ilmiahnya ya perlu di diuji secara klinis sesuai perkembangan zaman. Nah, dalam dalam hal sebelum pengujian secara klinis tidak bisa ya kita hanya ya hanya mengikuti yang dibuat oleh nenek moyang kita dan ternyata uh, setelah terjadinya covid semua empon-empon dimanapun dan pengusaha petani-petani empon-empon itu ya menjadi laris artinya bisa meningkatkan ekonomi nah, jadi monggo saya sebagai generasi lansia berpesan fakta 
saudara-saudara, mbak-mbak e, mas-mas e, ya. Apa yang saya utarakan hanya sebagian kecil yang sebenarnya dari Sabang, Merauke, Kalimantan sampai yang bagian selatan itu mas-mas mbak-mbak e belum semuanya tergali. Dan saudara-saudara lihat semua daftarnya itu, daftar ekonomi setelah dikaitkan dengan pariwisata, eh, apa fakta menunjukkan sama-sama beruntungnya. Dan saudara-saudara lihat harga-harganya, itu jamu-jamu, linu, dan lain sebagainya, 30.000 bisa untuk 9 kali. Jadi satu minuman hanya 3.300 lah. Sangat murah. Saudara-saudara, Mbak-Mbak E, Mas Masi mungkin juga melihat beberapa bulan yang lalu itu Sido Muncul Pak siapa itu? Irwan Hidayat mengekspor tolak angin ke negara Timur Tengah ke Arab Saudi nah, lalu redaksinya di di apa tidak hanya Inggris tapi bahasa setempat sana jadi saudara-saudara ande kata uh, ya ini fakta ande kata itu untuk kita sendiri saja saling menguntungkan lebih-lebih lagi nanti bisa menyumbangkan kepada eh, ya kalau sudah diuji klinis semua memang panjang itu kalau ingin ilmiah ya harus diuji klinis, klinis ya tapi juga saudara lihat misalnya yang dikerjakan oleh Pak Irwan Hidayat ya tolak angin eh, itu setahu saya dari ramuan macam gini dari pustaka-pustaka lama lalu dikemas secara modern ekspor dan itu itu sudah teruji. Nah, begitu aja. Jadi Mbak Mbak E, Mas Mas E, monggo silakan ya. Artinya ini merupakan warisan dan apa yang saya berikan. Saya tulis di situ mengenai bukti-bukti data-data di dalam perpustakaan-perpustakaan yang lama itu saya punya semua. Ya, lalu saya tambahkan itu yang sebenarnya juga itu di Tawang Mangu ada yang punyaan pemerintah yang saya juga beringinan kapan-kapan datang ke sana juga di Sukoharjo Solo ada pusat kampung obat jamu tradisional jadi Uh, ya terutama untuk kesehatan ya sudah terbukti uh, apa bisa menjaga imunitas menjaga kesehatan saya kira itu saja yang bisa saya sampaikan uh, moga moga nanti menjadi perhatian dan ada yang mengembangkan, melanjutkan seperti merapi farma herbal. Terima yeah. kasih dari Maturun. Oke, okay, Prof. Maturun sangat, Prof. Uh, so, I would like to summarize a bit. So, he say that the, the pandemic has shown us that uh, the, our ancestors' heritage, ecological, ecological heritage, are actually already proven to, to solve uh, our, 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 our health. And uh, because uh, during the pandemic, the 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 sale of of um, pon pon or uh, herbal drink are are rising, uh, but he also acknowledged that it needs to be clinically tested so it can really beneficial not only for Indonesian people but we can uh, share this this knowledge and this product to other other people in the world. So uh, before I give the floor back to the MC, I would like to summarize a bit about uh, our discussion. So 
Megan has uh, delivered the interesting presentations about medical travel and especially Indonesian medical travel. And uh, I really would like to emphasize the notion that medical travel actually is the phenomenon of uh, real, real, realizing our low quality health facilities back home. And uh, it shows that, that actually travel can prove us uh, the self-correction mechanism to improve our health system in, 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 in Indonesia or in other country. And hopefully uh, this medical travel can also lead uh, to greater health reform situations in Indonesia and other global South countries. And from Professor Marsono, we already uh, heard that uh, uh, Jamu is a very, uh, very beneficial uh, traditional medicine for us. And it's, it has been inherited uh, from our ancestors and it needs to be spread across and tourism can be a mechanism to, to, uh, to spread this, uh, this usefulness of Jamu uh, as herbal medicine, and hopefully, if it can, it can be researched uh, uh, ex more extensively, and it can be clinically tested, tested to uh, give jamu to to the world. So uh, I will uh, give the floor back to the TV. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I would like to thank you for all the participants and also Mr. Peter as the moderator. Uh, once again, I would like to thank you, Dr. Megan Armin. Thank you so much, especially for the information of Indonesia medical traveler. I was surprised about the record actually that we created in Malaysia. And also, thank you so much about, uh, for Professor Marsono for the information of Jamu and its historical process in the Jakarta. Thank you so much for uh, a good moderator, Mr. Peter. Uh, so before I close the this webinar, I would like uh, to have of our chairs. So please, for all participants and also guests, to actually open your camera so we can shoot a picture. So picture time, it's lovely. So we can count now. Satu. Yeah. Oh, TV, TV, satu, dua, tiga. <laughs> oh, yeah, I will count now and then the upper team will capture the, the faces. Okay, so one, two, three, say cheese. This way, Matt. Okay. Okay. Are you ready, my OP? Ready? I will call now. Three, two, one, thank you. It's done. Okay, it's done. So um, once again, ladies and gentlemen, all the participants. Now uh, we come to the end of this webinar of Health and Medical Tourism in Indonesia Challenges and Possibilities 2020. On behalf of the House and Committee, we would like to extend once again our deepest appreciation to all of you by supporting in participation, for sparing your time to attend this webinar for today. Once again, we would like to thank you. Good afternoon and wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Prof. Marsono. Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> <laughs>